Hello viewers, for DIYers here with another tutorial video for everyone. In this particular video here, I'll be doing a demonstration on how to rebuild a starter yourself at home. Don't forget to check out my website at www.4diyers.com and subscribe to my social media pages such as Google+, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Links are all included in the description below. This is a great way to save money considering it's only about $10 for replacement parts. And a rebuilt replacement can cost around $150 depending on the vehicle. The repair might be slightly more if you have to replace the solenoid. The starter I am working with today is from a 1998 Ford Ranger, and if you are looking for a specific video on how to remove it from that vehicle, I will include a link in the description below. I will also be including a full video on how to troubleshoot and bench test a starter once it's done as well, but some info will be included in this video too. First you will need to remove the starter from the vehicle. Removal processes will vary. Some vehicles will be extremely easy such as this one, others can be quite work intensive. Disconnect the battery cable first on the negative side. Then for the starter, there's two wires which need to be disconnected from the solenoid and three bolts holding a starter to the bell housing on the transmission. Now that we have the starter removed, the disassembly process can begin. I like to clean the outside first so the dirt doesn't contaminate areas inside. Tape any openings off on the starter motor assembly then use a scraper to clean off any excess dirt. Follow up with a wire brush to remove any finer dirt or rust. Doing this light cleanup also helps expose any casting seams, fasteners, and also cleans up any heads of fasteners to reduce the chance of them being stripped. Moving on to disassembly. Processes may vary slightly between starters, but overall the basic procedure will be very similar. Sometimes it helps to mark the casing seams or parts with a paint marker so you know where everything lines up, even take some photos for reference. Remove the main power cable coming off the solenoid. As you can see this cable is fairly corroded, so this could also be the no start issue, not allowing the engine to turn over. Once it's removed you are able to see that it falls apart. This cable directly connects to the new brushes, so it will be replaced, therefore it doesn't matter of its condition. Remove the outer bolts on the cap which holds the case together. These are extremely long and small so take the time as you do risk breaking them depending on the condition of your starter. The bolts close to the center hold the brush carrier into place. The starter should pop right apart but it appears something is stuck together. Do not force it if you are having issues as there is quite a few plastic components inside which can be broken therefore more parts will need to be replaced. Instead I'll remove the solenoid first which will give me a little extra room for movement on disassembly. It's held down with two torque screws on the mounting surface face. The plunger will fit into a small plastic fork so it does need to be shifted off to one side so it can be removed. Here's the solenoid fully removed. There will be a rubber cap holding the engagement lever into place. Remove that and then the motor will come apart along with the internal mechanism. Just to give you a little insight on how the assembly works, the plunger on the solenoid pulls in which in turn pushes the gear out, engaging to the flywheel. Internally the solenoid makes a connection inside when retracted activating the motor operation. If you find the starter motor turning but isn't engaging with the engine, then there is a broken mechanism between the end of the solenoid to the lever pushing the gear outward. The gear reduction just slides apart and inside you will find a series of gears. This is what gives the starter motor its torque. Finally accessing the brushes, remove the two bolts on the back side and pull off the cap. Again there is a small rubber cap on the side that both holds and insulates the cable which just slides out. Pull back on the shaft to help assist the armature and brushes out. Here is the brush carrier and we can see there is an issue already. The brushes are out in different distances which is most likely a result of uneven wear. Pop the metal clips back and remove the cap. Now you are able to see the difference in wear. These brushes on the one side are half worn compared to the others. Both the corroded cable on the outside and the brushes are most likely causing the issue. The starter wasn't getting a sufficient amount of power as a result of a poor connection. Fully remove the metal clips and pull the brushes out. Be extremely careful not to lose the springs in the process. After almost full disassembly, we should be left with something like this. I will be disassembling the final drive a little further on in the video. Using a degreaser, clean up any old lubricant. This will remove any worn out dried lubricant along with any possible dirt which has contaminated the internals over time. Use a degreaser that is also safe on plastic as some is known to attack the plastic components. Clean up each of the reduction gears. Starter designs may vary depending on your model. These reduction gears are equipped with needle bearings as well 
Therefore, spray the cleaner in the bearings to remove any old grease or dirt. The brush carrier is a composite or plastic assembly, so we can use a degreaser on this to remove any unwanted dirt. A clean carrier is important as it reduces the chance of any brushes sticking. For further disassembly of the final drive, there is a C-clip at the end of the shaft that holds the pinion gear into place. To remove this, I used an adjustable wrench to push it off from the shaft. Just set up the opening so it's about the same size as the shaft and so it can slide past the shaft when pushing off the C-clip. Don't lose the clip during this removal process. Remove the pinion gear and clutch assembly, inspect for any damage and replace if necessary. Remove another C-clip, this time using the needle nose pliers to separate from the final drive shaft. Don't lose the clip here either. You can also use the assistance of a standard screwdriver when it's slightly off if needed. Clean up everything using a degreaser. There will be a bushing inside the case so inspect that for any damage and replace if necessary. Now for reassembly, apply a film of grease to any moving parts here. First between the bushing and the shaft, then reinstall the C-clip and ensure it is seated correctly. Use a high quality grease throughout the starter motor, something which is able to maintain good lubrication qualities in cold climates and not melt under extreme heat. Apply a film of grease to the Bendix drive. Apply some grease to the outside of the clutch and pinion gear where it does slide onto the shaft. Once it is installed, then wipe off any access grease. Considering this area tends to be a little more exposed, this will reduce the chance of any dirt sticking to the shaft. Reinstall the C-clip, pop it back into place using pliers and ensure it is seated correctly. Continue to the gear reduction side. There will be a small ball bearing that allows the movement between the assembly and the motor's armature. Apply a small amount of grease and push it back into its location. The grease will provide some lubrication along with holding the ball back into place. Make sure you do not lose it when reassembling everything. Apply more grease to the face and shafts. Then to each one of the gears, both on the inside where the bearings are and outside. Reinstall the gears and apply a light coat of grease again. There will be a bushing in the end cap housing, therefore make sure it is in good condition with no play. These can be replaced if needed and are only a few dollars. Considering these are oil light bushings, they are self lubricating. If you wish, you can add a little oil. Do not use grease as it will plug up the bushing. For the end cap, there is also a bushing that holds the armature into place. This side is worn and will need to be replaced. As you can see, there is some play in the bushing visually, but I have also used a bore gauge and a micrometer to check the dimensions. To remove the bushing, there is a specific bearing puller for this job, but unfortunately I do not have one. So instead, I used a hacksaw blade to cut a small slit in the bushing. Do not cut all the way through, as you can risk marking the casting. Use a chisel then to crush the bushing and then you'll be able to remove it. Clean up the hole and any old lubricant or dirt. Gently insert the new bushing with the hammer. Once it becomes a little lower, use the old bushing to help assist it into place and ensure it sits in the same location as before. Now you're able to see the difference with the new bushing installed. I will have a more in-depth video for cleaning and testing the armature which I will include in the description below once released. In this video I will give a briefer overview. Start by cleaning up the armature using an electrical contact cleaner and a toothbrush. Only use an electronic safe cleaner as this will not damage the armature. The commutator will need to be cleaned up and resurfaced using 600 grit sandpaper and a drill. Using a drill is much easier to allow for a level surface. We do not want to create any high or low spots on the commutator as that can cause issues. Once satisfied, clean up the commutator using an electrical contact cleaner and ensure the spaces between the commutator bars are clean. The mica in these spaces should be about 1 millimeter lower so this won't cause contact issues between the commutator and brushes. After the commutator has been cleaned, we can now have an accurate test to determine if it's faulty. There are three tests which can be done using a multimeter. Set the multimeter to the lowest ohm setting so we are able to test the resistance or continuity. First for a continuity test between each of the individual bars and the armature shaft which is ground. We do not want any continuity between each bar and the shaft otherwise that will indicate a short in the circuit. Second is a bar to bar test on the commutator to determine the resistance. There is a specific value based on the design of the commutator 
but for this we are looking for a large fluctuation between the readings which will determine there is a fault. Lastly, between two bars at 180 degrees or across from each other on the commutator. Again, there is a specific reading depending on the design of the armature, but in this case we are looking for a large fluctuation between the values. After the commutator has passed all these tests, then it is good to reuse. If it has failed one of these tests, then it can be replaced or rebuilt if you have the option available to you. Wash the inside of the starter case with contact cleaner to remove any contaminants. I decided to give the case and solenoid a cleanup. First I removed the dirt and rust. I used a sandblaster in this situation and taped up any areas that I didn't want the blasting media to get into. Then apply a coat of primer and paint. I didn't paint the cast aluminum end cap, but you can if you want to. I just cleaned it up with a brass wire brush instead. I've already checked the solenoid with a multimeter to ensure it's functioning correctly, but here is a test so you know. First, set the multimeter to the lowest ohm setting, and then measure the coil. The case of the solenoid is ground, but considering I've already repainted it, I will be using the mounting hole as a source for a test probe. Place the other test probe on the small post, which is a switching wire. Resistance values will depend on the solenoid's design, so you will need to refer to your manufacturer's specifications. Next, to test the contact inside the solenoid. Considering this is a high amperage circuit, the contacts internally can weld together, therefore preventing the starter from turning off. Just doing a simple continuity test, just set the meter on the lowest ohm setting. Now touch the test probes on both the larger posts. This should be an open circuit. If it isn't, then the solenoid is faulty. Now push the solenoid close and test again. There should be continuity between the two posts now. If not, then the contacts inside have failed and the solenoid will be replaced. For reassembly, install the final drive back into the case. Ensure everything is seated correctly. Now install the rubber cap and the solenoid. The solenoid can be oriented in two ways. It isn't really important which way it sits. The only issue you may have is the wiring length on the vehicle. But if you are unsure which way it was positioned, just inspect the witness marks on the mounting surface. Clip it back into the lever fork and then install the fasteners. Install a divider plate of the gear reduction assembly. Then install the motor case and ensure it is oriented in the correct location. This model fits together only one way. Some others may have multiple orientations. Insert the brushes into the brush carrier. Brushes should be seated to prevent any damage of the armature or brushes. Using 600 grit sandpaper, wrap the abrasive side outward tightly around the commutator and then put the brushes into place along with the carrier. Now carefully insert the springs to push tension on the brushes. Determine which direction the armature rotates as this will be putting a leading and trailing edge on the brushes. Now rotate the brush carrier. Some brushes may be pre-curved so it's fairly easy to seat them. Others like this will be flat and it will take a little longer to seat. The brushes are made of a soft material so this can be done only in a couple minutes. Only sand the brushes in the direction of travel. Remove the brushes and check the face to ensure they are evenly worn. In order to remove them, take the springs out first. Wash the brushes and armature off with contact cleaner. Now insert the armature into the case. This might be a little tricky as the magnets inside of the case will want to suck it into position, so keep a firm grip on it. Do not allow it to pop together on its own as we do risk damaging some internal components. Rotate the armature so it's able to mesh with the gears in the final drive. Insert the brush carrier without the springs first. Then insert the springs, again being careful not to damage the brushes. It's easier to insert a bolt to help hold the carrier when pushing the springs into place. Once the springs have been inserted, then put the cap into place. Now install the outer end cap. Install the fasteners. Don't tighten everything down just yet to give a bit of movement for the brush carrier fasteners too. Finally, ensure all the fasteners are tightened down, both for the solenoid and bolts in the motor case. Insert the main power cable to the solenoid. This one has a tab to prevent it from rotating. Some may not. Carefully tighten the bolt down so it doesn't twist and damage the wire. Make sure the bolt is tight, as these can loosen up due to heat, therefore causing starting issues afterwards. Finally, you're done. This is what you should be left with. It is now ready to reinstall back on your vehicle.
you not only have the satisfaction of completing this repair yourself, but you also saved a huge chunk of money in the process with both replacement and rebuild. Be sure to stay up to date with my latest videos. Subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking on the button below the video. This concludes the rest of my video. Be sure to give it a thumbs up, and if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to post them. Thank you for watching.